Um, I want to bring you a message tonight. I'm going to start with two verses of Scripture in Luke chapter 11. And not long ago on a Sunday morning, I, I preached through uh, the end of Luke 11, which was like 15 verses or so. Um, and I want to look at just two verses of that same passage from Luke 11, verse 51 and 52, I believe it is, where Jesus, uh, Jesus says this. And again, when you read Luke 11, he's talking to some Pharisees, uh, some of which we talked about this morning, the Pharisees and, and their hypocrisy and so forth. And he, in, in Luke 11, Jesus is really letting them have it, specifically addresses several things they're doing wrong. But in the middle of that, Jesus says this, He says, Therefore, therefore this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we, we thank you for all the blessings that you, you shower on us. Uh, we continue to pray for all the, all the names on our prayer list and those who have been mentioned here tonight and those uh, homebound that would love to be here with us, uh, those in the hospital tonight um, that would love to be here with us, and those all those who have lost loved ones. Uh, many of our own members who have lost loved ones, uh, and though it's, though it's been a few days, that grieving process is still going on. I lift their needs up to you. Thank you that you hear and you love us and you are what the Holy Spirit calls you in, in the Corinthian letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the God of all comfort. We thank you, Father, for your comfort, your love, and your mercy. And we're thankful for your mercy, which is uh, the topic of our lesson tonight. Uh, may we understand your mercy and uh, understand your goodness a little more clearly tonight as we look at Scripture together. May you be glorified here. May everything said and done uh, be pleasing in your sight. We ask that you grow your church. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so in the middle of this passage here in Luke 11, Jesus is letting the Pharisees have it, and he says this, Therefore this generation will be held responsible for all the blood that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel... That's Cain. Cain killed Abel. Two brothers, children of uh, Adam and Eve. Um, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Jesus says to the Pharisees, this generation will be held responsible for all that blood. From the blood of Abel. That had happened, mind you, several, uh, a couple thousand years there prior from the blood of Abel, the blood of all the prophets, even the blood of Zechariah. Now, Abel occurs in the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible. Zechariah occurs, um, I think it's in 2 Kings, but also in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Um, Zechariah's blood is in the last historical book, the last book of the kings in the Old Testament. So, from, from the very beginning to the very end, Jesus says this generation is going to be held responsible for all that blood. Our lesson tonight is on Zechariah and, and who this is. Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Well, the Bible tells us when we study over in 2 Chronicles 22, it says when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. Now what happened was uh, Ahaziah was a king of Judah. He was a wicked king. He was bad. And, and he ended up, he got killed by Jehu, uh, who had been anointed by Elisha the prophet to be the king of Israel. Israel being the northern kingdom, Judah being the southern kingdom. But Ahaziah was a descendant of David. Ahaziah was a descendant of David. His mother's name was Athaliah. Say Athaliah. Athaliah was a woman whose son was the king. That makes her the queen mom, you know. Ahaziah died. Jehu killed him. So she sees that nobody was strong enough in all of uh, Ahaziah's house. Nobody could be king. So what she did was she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family 
of the house of Judah. That's problematic on a lot of different levels. Uh, but primarily, God had said to David in Psalm 89 verse 29 that David's throne, David's line would be established forever. But this wicked and evil lady tried to kill off the entire uh, line uh, of the tribe of Judah. She tried to kill off everybody. And she nearly succeeded. The Bible tells us that for six years, it says, uh, of course, Ahaziah, Ahaziah had a child, a little baby. His name was Joash. And Joash, they hid him from his wicked grandma, uh, Athaliah. And Joash remained hidden at the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. That's something we don't always talk about. When's the last time you heard somebody talk about the, the wicked, uh, wicked queen of Judah? We always talk about kings. You don't ever think about the queen. But actually for six years they had a queen. And she was wicked and she was evil. And uh, she worshipped idols and so forth. And they took this little baby Joash and they hid him in the temple. And the priest actually raised him. The priest who were Levites. They raised him. One priest, the, the head of the priest, was uh, Jehoiada. And he raised Joash from the time he was a little baby in the temple. And the Bible tells us Joash was seven years old when he became king of Judah and he reigned in Jerusalem. How many years? He was seven years old when he became king. That's pretty cool, right? He reigns for, seven, or for 40 years. Now, you'll find out about his daddy that Ahaziah only reigned a short time. Uh, what, a year, two years, something like that? What's it say, W? He's got his Bible open back here. Ahaziah only ruled for a little while. Um, when you see a king, it's kind of a rule of thumb. When you see a king who has a uh, long or lengthy rule, most of the time it's an indicator whether he's a good king or a bad king. The fact that he ruled for 40 years is a lot. But remember, he was seven when he became king, so he died at 47. Um, but the Bible just tells us plainly if they're good kings or bad kings. It says about um, jo Joash, it says about Joash that uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. Now when he was seven years old, they took him out of the temple, they blew their trumpets, they announced that he was alive, that he was king, that he was a descendant of David, and they killed Athaliah. That's what happened to her, they killed her. And they made jo uh, uh, Joash to be king. So Joash is king over all the people now, seven years old. And the Bible says he did what was right all the years of Jehoiada the priest. Now that's an indicator. As long as Jehoiada the priest lived, he did good. After that, he didn't do good anymore. So this is what happens. While Jehoiada the priest was alive, they actually restored the temple. The temple was, I'm guessing they're a couple hundred years old. Uh, it had deteriorated some. It needed some tender loving care. needed some restoration. So what they did was they put a big wooden chest out front. And they cut a hole in the top of it. And when the people come in to worship, they would put their money in the wooden chest. So that's where you get it. You've ever seen stuff like that happen? You put a little box and you put the piggy bank, you know, put the slit on top of it. I think it comes right there from the Bible. That's what Jehoiada did. And when they stored up enough money... The Levites took that money and they, they got to restore the temple. They did a lot of great work. Joash did good all the years of Jehoiada the priest. And the Bible says about Jehoiada the priest, Jehoiada was old and full of years. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 15. He was old and full of years and he died at the age of 130. That's really old. Uh, that's really old, especially at that time. Back early in the Bible, people lived longer. Abraham lived to be 175. Jacob lived to be 147. Adam, from Adam and Eve, lived to be 930 and so forth. But at this period of time, 130 was really old. He was a righteous man. Jehoiada was. He lived to be old, full of years, and he died. After he died is when things fell apart for Joash. Now remember Joash, from the time he was an infant, he'd been raised at the temple. Jehoiada, for all intents and purposes, was his father. Uh, in that he raised the little baby. He taught him right from wrong. He steered him in the way he should go. He actually, when you study in 2 Chronicles 24, he picked out wives for Joash. Uh, Jehoiada was his father figure. And Jehoiada died. 
The Bible tells us what happens next. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king. And he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their fathers. They spent so many years restoring the temple, studying the law, serving the one true God. But after Jehoiada died, the officials of Judah came and he listens to them and they abandon the temple, the God of their fathers. Moreover, they worshipped Asherah poles and idols. And because of their guilt, God's anger came upon Judah and Jerusalem. As soon as Jehoiada dies, they start worshipping idols and it all falls apart. And it's almost just a replay of what we see unfold time and time again through the Bible. After Moses died, the people did what was right all the days of Joshua. And it says, the people of Israel followed God after, after Joshua died until the elders who knew Joshua died. And then everything just fell apart. People started being wild and doing... And twice in the book of Judges it said everyone did as he saw fit in his own eyes. It just unfolds time and again. They do good for a while and then it falls apart. After Jehoiada died, Joash is a wicked and evil man. This is what happens. The Bible says the Lord sent prophets. He sent prophets to bring the people back to him. And though they testified against them, they would not listen. Joash wouldn't listen when the prophets of God came to speak the word of God. They wouldn't listen. They were serving idols. They were worshiping idols. They turned from the temple. They, uh, at times, we know later in the Old Testament times, they closed the doors of the temple. They locked them shut. I mean, they turned entirely from God. At one point in the Old Testament, it says that they worshiped God on, or they worshiped idols on every street corner in Jerusalem. They were wicked people. God sent them prophets time and again to turn them back. But they wouldn't listen. Moreover, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. This is Joash's brother for all intents and purposes. Jehoiada, his son was Zechariah, and Jehoiada raised Zechariah, Jehoiada raised Joash. And the Bible tells us expressly in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 20, the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood up before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, He has forsaken you. That's a hard message. Zechariah, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he delivers the message that God would have him to preach. And this is what happens. The Bible says they plotted against him. They plotted against Zechariah. And by order of the king. Who's the king? It starts with J. It ends with Oash. Who's the king? Joash. It's basically uh, his brother. By orders of the king, Joash, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. This is Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple that had everything, uh, they cut every stone in the quarry and they hauled it in. You didn't even hear the sound of a hammer when they built the temple because everything was cut precisely and hauled in and placed precisely in its exact location. This is Solomon's temple where they had the whole entire inside line with cedar and on top of that they put gold, gold over everything, so much splendor, so much gold. The, the centerpiece was the most holy place where only the high priest could go and only once a year, never without blood. And back there in the most holy place they had the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence of God Almighty. Inside the Ark was uh, Aaron's staff that had budded, a gold jar of manna and the Ten Commandments. According to the book of Hebrews, that's what it says. This is Solomon's temple. This is God's location. What God said to David, David took that city from the Jebusites. They named it Jerusalem. It was called the city of David, the city of God. And I want you to imagine what happens in 2 Chronicles 24 in downtown Jerusalem. The city of God at the Lord's temple designated the Lord's presence. You've got a man speaking the words of God. Who is stoned to death 
by the order of the king of Judah, descendant of David, mind you. He's stoned to death by the king's order in the courtyard of the temple. If you think that's bad, do your head like this right here. They stoned a man to death in God's city at God's temple for speaking the word of God. And the next time you turn on your TV and some newscaster or some old timer says, it's never been this bad before. Just pull out your Bible and read 2 Chronicles 24. Because in God's city, at God's temple for speaking the word of God, people have been stoned to death before. Before any of us were ever born. That's what happened to Zechariah. Moreover, when they stoned him to death, the Bible says, Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father, Jehoiada, had shown to him, but killed his son. It's hard to miss what that verse is really implying. If Joash didn't remember the kindness of the father, so he killed the son. That sound familiar to anybody? You don't remember what the father has done, so you kill the father's son. Zachariah said this when he was being stoned. The Bible says, uh, Zachariah said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. And that's where we started. When we opened up our sermon tonight, our lesson tonight, we looked at Luke 11 verse 50. Jesus is in the middle of a sermon. He's preaching to Pharisees who claim to be religious and have all the answers about God. And they are just about to forget all the kindness of God the Father and about to kill God's only Son. And in the middle of that talk, Jesus says in Luke 11, verse 51 and 2, He says, Therefore, this generation, you Pharisees, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Jesus tells them from Abel, the first, the first book of the Bible, the first historical book of the Bible, to, the, to, to uh, Second Chronicles, the last historical book of the Old Testament. From the first to the last, Jesus says this generation will be held responsible for for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed. And the only way that I found to uh, reconcile these verses. How, how could that generation. And, and just in speaking in generalities. A generation at this time would last about 40 years. About 40 years a generation. About 40 years. How would this generation be held responsible for blood that happened before they were even born? And the only way I know to reconcile it is, is 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., which was, you know Jesus lived to be 30 years old. We started His ministry, Luke 3, verse 23, which said He was 30 years old. You, you count the Passover feast, we know His ministry lasted three years there. Jesus died at 33 years old. You take 33 years, you add 40 years. And that's about where we're at. In 70 A.D., this generation, Jesus said, will be held responsible for all the blood of the prophets, from Abel to Zechariah. And what happened in 70 A.D. is the Jews were inside the city of Jerusalem. I understand, if I remember correctly, it was a time of Passover. The city of Jerusalem was full of the Roman army, army with Titus as general, who later became emperor of Rome. He came marching against the city, surrounded it. He starved them out. And then he took the city. They burnt down most of the buildings by accident. The temple was included. They burned it down. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The Jewish people have no genealogical records. They don't have a Levitical priesthood. They have no high priest. They have no Ark of the Covenant. They have no altar. They have no sacrificial system, not like the law of Moses required. Um, they have no Ten Commandments, only copies. They don't have the original the Jewish people and their, the entire Jewish religious system 
was destroyed in 70 A.D. and it's never been reestablished. When you look at a picture of Jerusalem, if you, you can Google, on, Google Earth and go into Jerusalem, the most outstanding feature in downtown Jerusalem is a mosque that the Muslims built when, when they took in the Dark Ages and a series of, of the wars, uh, they took the city and built a mosque. The temple in Jerusalem has never been rebuilt. It's not going to be rebuilt. At least that's my opinion. Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews and He's reigning today at the right hand of God. There's no need to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And Christian, when you study it out, we actually, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which you have received from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What happened was it was God's wrath poured out on that city. What happened was it was God's wrath. When you study the Bible, it's over and over. It's, it's Noah when all the people were evil all the time. God's wrath destroyed the world and only eight souls were saved by water. Um, when you study it out, the, city, uh, the cities of, in Canaan, the land of Canaan, Joshua and the children went in and they poured out wrath on those who lived there. When, when the children of Israel turned evil like we see in 2 Chronicles 24, the Babylonians came and the wrath of God was poured out on Jerusalem through the Babylonians. And then 600 years later when the Romans came, God's wrath was poured out upon that city once more with the Romans. It's just a picture. When Zechariah lay dying and say, may, may the Lord see this and call you to account. It's what God did in 70 A.D. They were held accountable for what they'd done. And when I was studying this out... I came this close because I know we're, we're Thanksgiving and I try to, you know, try to work in something about being thankful. And I did that this morning, thankful, uh, thankfully authentic. And tonight, thankful. I came this close to call this uh, thankful for justice. Because, you know, you think about Zachariah in the city of David, the city of God, preaching the Word of God at the temple of God. It's just not right that he was stoned to death. It bothers me that they would take children of Abraham would stone the prophet of God to death in the temple courtyard. It's just not right. And I do know the Bible says this in uh, Romans 12 verse 9. It says, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And when I see the injustice of Zechariah, and I see what eventually God was, may God see this and hold you accountable. Justice was eventually brought about. Justice eventually came on all the world that flooded when Noah was there, when the Joshua went in, when the Babylonians came. Justice eventually came, and I almost called this sermon thankful for justice, man. I'm thankful when I see somebody's been raped on TV, the, the wrong will be made right at the end of the day. When I see somebody who's open up and killing people with uh, weapons in, in Las Vegas and are open up and killing strangers just shooting aimlessly into a crowd, it, it makes me feel good that justice will be brought about, that God is going to make all the wrongs right. I, I want to say thankful for, thankful for justice. But as I was writing this sermon, I was just convicted. I don't, I don't want justice. If I were truly want justice, it's me that deserves to pay. I've been as selfish as anybody in the world could be. I've acted just the same way. I've lusted and lied and greedy and hateful. I say things that I shouldn't say. I hurt people that I love the most. I'm more likely to say something to them and I wouldn't say to you strangers out there. I mean, I wouldn't say it to you because uh, I don't want you all to think bad of me, but somebody I love and I'd say something that I wouldn't say to anybody else. I'm guilty, man. And when you, when you really think about it, I don't want justice. I want mercy. And what I'm thankful for is, is God has designed, He's decided, He decided before the world began, that's Jesus' lamb slain from the creation of the world, that He's willing to give mercy to anybody that will seek it. And He's provided, it was God set up that it required blood. 
And from the very beginning, when the Israelites left the land of bondage from Egypt, it was required with blood. They had to put blood on the doorpost. And if God saw the blood, the Bible says, as Exodus 12, verse 13, it says the blood. The blood will be a sign for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And in God's system and God's justice, the price for sin has been paid in full. We couldn't pay it. We couldn't lay our lives down to satisfy it. But God stepped in and paid it for us. And what was true in the Old Testament is still true today. The blood is a sign between us and God. And when He sees the blood of Jesus is applied to our accounts, it's considered paid in full. You don't pay for your sin anymore when it's paid in full. When Jesus, you accept His sacrifice, it means you're forgiven. I'm thankful for mercy that's extended to you and me and every tribe, every language, every people, every color, everywhere, everybody. It's what we don't deserve. It's a free gift of God. You can call it grace. Because that's what it is. Justice is coming for those who don't accept the forgiveness. The Bible tells us we're about, to, we're about to get in if the Lord allows into our Christmas season. We remember a little baby in the manger. He's harmless and offensive, uh, offenseless right there in the, uh, in the manger. He just coos and cuddles and all the world loves Jesus at Christmas time. But the Bible tells us He was perfect. He died for sin. He rose King of kings, Lord of lords. And the Bible says when He's coming for the second time, it's not going to be cooing in a manger. It's not going to be just for a handful of uh, shepherds to wander by. When He comes next time, it's for all the world to see. Every eye that uh, will see Him, even those that pierced Him, Revelation 1 verse 7 says, the Bible says, when He appears, it will be in blazing fire with His powerful angels. <clears throat> he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. God brought about justice in His own time. Justice is coming. The wrath of God will be poured out. And the only way to escape what you rightfully deserve is the grace of God available by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood will be a sign for you. And when He sees the blood, you are forgiven. You are passed over. You get victory, a home in heaven. As we stand.